Today we're going to do Divine Healing Light. This will be session four. And what we're going to talk about are these things. So first of all, we finished up uh, over the last couple of sessions, we finished up the Divine Healing Foundation. And there's really five key principles there that we talked about. Uh, number one is we have to realize that Satan is responsible for sickness and death. Number two is we need to know the will of God because the Bible says we can pray for anything according to the will of God and the answer is yes. And so when we study God's good will, we, we find that his desire is that he wants us to be healthy, he wants us to be healed, he wants us to be whole, and this applies to body and soul. And in fact, Jesus, he paid for the healing of all people, just like he paid for the the sins of all people, he paid for the prosperity of all people, he paid for the protection of all people. Everything Jesus ever did, he did for all people, which includes healing. Okay, then we, the fourth thing that we talked about last time was that God equipped us to walk in health, he equipped us to defend ourselves, and he equipped us to perform miraculous divine healing just like Jesus did. And he did that by giving us the authority of Jesus Christ by giving us the Holy Spirit and by giving us his miraculous dunamis power, which is that power that Jesus used to heal the sick. All right. And then the last thing we talked about last time was that we minister healing by operating in authority by commanding. So then today what we'll talk about is that we'll talk about persistence. You know, so sometimes in, in, in my experience, more often than not, we have to persist in prayer over some amount of time to get a complete result. Then we'll talk about casting down words and thoughts which contradict health and healing. And then we'll talk about, you know, and this is an important one. A lot of times people think, well, it's not God's will that somebody be healed because it's taking time or they'll be healed in God's time. And, and they come up with things like that and all that's wrong. And so we're going to talk about the timing of healing. And then lastly, we'll talk about some tips for ministering healing to ourselves. And um, and so the purpose of this teaching wasn't to go as in-depth as I have in some of the previous healing teachings, but really to be, um, to refresh our faith because <laughs> me personally, I got sick twice in the last six months and that should not happen. I should, I will never get sick again. Amen. Jesus paid for me to walk in health and that's the way it's going to be. And I'm going to keep my faith tuned up and I'm going to continue to walk in health just like I did prior to that bad six month period. Amen. And I want the same for all of you. I want all of you, I want all of us to walk in health. I don't want any of us to need healing. I want healing to be something that we give away for other people, but we shall never need it ourselves. That's the perfect thing that Jesus paid for. Okay, so um, let's talk about persistence. And we'll just start with um, Matthew chapter 15. And this is the story about this was not a Jewish lady. This was a Canaanite, right? And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to Jesus saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. But Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel then she came and worshiped Jesus, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, A woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Okay, so here... Um, here you have this lady, so she's not even, you know, she's not even a, a Jewish person. She's a Canaanite, and so they would consider her a Gentile, but yet she had heard about Jesus, and so she had faith in him that he could set her daughter free. And so Jesus was pretending to be stubborn, pretending like he was going to say no, but he didn't say no. He said yes. And she's only the second person there's only two people in the bible that jesus ever said had great faith one was the roman centurion who understood the concept of authority and jesus said that he had never seen such great faith not even in israel 
And again, that was not even an, an Israelite, right? It was, a, it was a Roman who had the great faith. And then here we have a Canaanite and she has great faith. So it's really interesting that even um, outsiders were able to see the, and hear the works that Jesus was doing. And by way of the testimonies that they saw or heard, their faith arose. And so she, she had great faith because she was persistent and insistent. Like she wasn't going to let him leave without her daughter being healed, right? And so the reality is, you know, God's not delaying or postponing our healing. In fact, all this happened in just a couple of minutes, you know. So in a, in a couple of minutes of her persistence, um, her daughter was healed. And so we just want to take the, the key principle here is be persistent until the job is done. And it's not God that resists us. It's the devil that resists us. Okay. And so we're resisting him. We're being persistent against him. And, you know, our persistence isn't upon God. Our persistence is against the devil. Okay. And in Luke 18, Jesus was giving a parable about the need for persistence and insistence. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart saying there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear god nor regard man now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying get justice for me from my adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself though i do not fear god nor regard man yet because this widow troubles me i will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me Okay, so I put some things in parentheses here to just kind of make it really clear what's going on. So this person was like the devil. Okay, this this unjust judge. He was he's a representation of the devil. Okay, he doesn't fear God because the devil doesn't, and he doesn't regard man, and the devil doesn't. You know, and, and so you have this ungodly judge, just like we have an ungodly devil, and yet he didn't want to give justice to this woman. But because she kept troubling him, you know, she kept coming, unless um, by her continual coming, she weary me. And so the principle here is that this lady was extremely persistent. She wasn't going to give up. She was persistent and insistent that this ungodly judge, that um, he give her justice. And so finally, because of her persistence, he gave in. So in the same way, you know, we know that God's will is for us to be healed. And we know that his will is for us to heal others. So we know his good will, but sometimes we're praying and praying and it seems like it's taking forever. And it's not God that's delaying things. It's the fact that we have an enemy who's resisting and resisting and resisting because he wants to break our will, right? And if he gets us to break our will, if he gets us to make a negative confession, oh, I guess it isn't working. And he wants to do that because if he can get you to speak negative faith, then he'll then he'll win, right? He'll cancel that good work that we were doing with prayer. It'll get nullified and voided if the devil can trick us into making a negative confession of faith. You know, I've been praying for this person, but it just isn't working. You know, they're never going to be healed. They're going to die. You know, and he tries to get you to give up and to make that negative confession. But we have to be, we have to be diligent in our words, especially like we, even if we have a doubt like arising inside of us, we never want to confess that doubt you know, because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we don't want to we don't want to speak the power of death. Amen. Even though we're tempted to, even though the circumstance looks bleak, we don't want to speak that doubt because then it can come true and the devil will win. So we need to you know, refresh ourselves like in those stubborn situations. And, you know, we need to listen to what Jesus said, that we always need to pray and not lose heart. And the things we can do to not lose heart would be to edify one another. Like I could be down and you could boost me up. You could be down. I could boost you up. And we could go back to the scriptures and, you know, look at the promises, especially watch and read testimonies just day in and day out, just devour testimonies. And those things are going to help you to not lose heart. Those things will help you to be persistent. Those things will help you to cling on to the promises of God. Amen. And, and it works. And, and, you know, an example of that would be, I guess about a year, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, uh, my mom had nearly died and she, 
she had uh, she had lung failure, she had heart failure, and thing we were praying and praying, and you know it would get a little better, and then it would get worse, and then it get a little better and worse, and so then. You know, my dad came to me and I was feeling, I was about to throw in the towel. Like my, my faith was getting wearied and my dad's was worse than mine. And he came to me, you know, looking for encouragement. So I had to pretend like I had some big faith that I felt like was shriveling up. But in the process of, you know, in the process of trying to encourage my dad, I had to re-speak scriptures to him. I had to re-speak the will of God to him. And, and, and it built him up, but it also built me up as well. And so just edifying one another in a difficult time is going to be tremendously helpful. And, of course, my mom ended up, she, she got the victory. Amen. We didn't give up, even though we were tempted to. We had to remain persistent. We had to remain insistent. And we have to remember that every promise of God, the answer is yes and amen, unless you back away from it. And so we don't want to back away from it. And and the devil, he, he resists us for that purpose. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, then um, a key principle is we want to realize that, you know, it's okay and expected to pray more than once. In fact, Jesus ministered healing to somebody more than once. We have um, one example of that in Mark 8, 22 to 25. Then Jesus came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Okay, so Jesus, the word of God, Jesus, the one who is perfect in faith. Jesus, the one who came down from heaven and came to this earth. You know, perfect Jesus. He himself had to minister healing to somebody two times. And so if Jesus had to minister healing some, to somebody two times, then we're guaranteed that we're going to have situations where we have to pray twice or five times or ten times. I've even prayed as many as a hundred times for somebody that had kidney failure and his kidneys were restored. Amen? And so... You know, the principle that we get that we get from this is when Jesus put his hands on him the first time, he saw men like trees walking. Okay, so the first time Jesus ministered, there was a partial healing. And then Jesus put his hands on his eyes a second time, and then he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Okay, so the principle was, okay, the guy was blind, right? So his you know, his health was here, his vision was here. Then Jesus prayed once and his vision came up to here. And then Jesus prayed a second time and he had perfect vision. And so each, each time Jesus ministered, it added more and more healing. So that's an important principle for us to keep in mind. So over here on the right, you know, you have somebody who's, you know, 0% healthy, meaning they're dead. And you have somebody who's 100% healthy, which they're just in perfect health. And so let's just say that the person you're ministering to, they're, they're pre getting pretty close to dying, right? So they come to you and they say, hey, you know, will you pray for me? Because I'm, I'm about to die. <laughs> and they're way down here at the bottom. And so, and so you do, right? And so you pray. And then a common thing that happens is we don't see anything. And, and you know, we're very visual. We, we're very sensual. And we need to break out of that because, you know, what we see and hear, some, a lot of times that limits our faith. So you always want to keep in, in mind this principle of the blind man. So, you know, he was completely blind and then Jesus prayed and he saw some and he prayed again and he saw more. So the mindset we want to have is even though I don't see the healing yet, I know that I have added healing to his body. Okay, And then you pray a second time and then you still don't see the healing. But I, I have in my mind, you know, I'm adding to my last prayer. I'm adding more health upon this person. Then you pray the third time and you're like right at the threshold, like somewhere, somewhere on this thermometer, there's, there's a threshold where you can't see it. And then suddenly you begin to see it. Right. And, and so like the third time you pray, you're starting to maybe get discouraged. Like, you know, I pray three times. I don't see anything yet, but you know what? My mind is that I'm adding more each time I pray, I'm adding more. And then finally, the fourth time you pray, you're like, oh my God, I can see it now. And so then you're encouraged because you can see it. The principle is you want to keep praying. And every time you pray, you're adding 
more healing, more healing, more healing. And that's the mindset you need to have. And then you want to continue that until they're at 100, 100%. Amen? So Jesus is the example of it. He taught us about persistence. And if we just have this simple principle in mind, then we're going to have more confidence as we're praying and not yet seeing things, which happens a lot, right? So if we, have, if we keep this in mind, we're going to get more and more victories. Amen? Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, especially when something's taking, you know, when something is taking, you know, a significant amount of time, that gives a lot of opportunity for doubt to come in. And the doubt can come from, you know, what doctors are saying, what family is saying, what, um, what you're researching online, you know, any number of places the doubt can come from. It could be words that are spoken. It could be lab reports. There's all these ideas that can be warring against your faith, especially when there's some period of time that you're having to wait. Something that's very important is we don't want to accept those words or those thoughts that are failure, uh, failure oriented, right? We want to, we want to be believing in the promises of God and we want to be speaking the promises of God, but we want to make sure that we never accept the failure that the devil's trying to get us to embrace. And we don't want death. We don't want hardship. We don't want limitations for the person, you know, going into the future or whatever other things are being spoken. And so it's important to always remember Proverbs 18, 20 to 21, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, from the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Okay, so if the doctor gives you a doomsday report and says, you know, the, the lab report says that you have, you know, stage four cancer, there's nothing we can do about it, you're going to die. And then if you were to take that and just start telling everybody, I have stage four cancer, I'm going to die, and you start proclaiming that, that bad news, then unfortunately, it's going to come true because, you know, the doctor told you something, you believed it, okay, that's called faith, and then you speak it, then you have put your faith into motion, and then unfortunately, you'll receive that. So the principle is that faith works in a negative direction and faith works in a positive direction. And a challenge for us in our society is that we're so oriented to believe everything the doctor says. We're so oriented to believe the lab report, the, the lab result, and whatever scientific evidence is given to us, we exalt that above all things, and we make that the core of what we're believing. And that's unfortunate because we need God's word to be the primary thing that we're believing, right? So we have to be careful not to take that bad news that the doctor tells you and then start proclaiming it as though it's true and as though it's going to happen, because then it certainly will. Okay, so what do we do about that? Well, we, we need to lay hold of God's wisdom. And so throughout all the first three sessions, we learn what God's will is. And so now we need to stick with that, because there's going to be a war that happens between what the devil's trying to bring forth uh, and what God has for us, what Jesus already paid for. And so let's read 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 21. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the understanding of the experts. Where is the philosopher? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish. For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. Okay, so this is this is something that's going to face us in almost every problem of life. There's going to be, you know, there's a promise in the Bible that's good news, and we struggle to believe that sometimes. And then there's what some so-called, you know, expert is saying, like the doctor or the lab technician that does a lab result or, or whatever expert for whatever problem you're facing. So the problem is that you have wisdom of the world that comes from a so-called expert, and then you have God's wisdom and the promises in the Bible. And the challenge we have is we're being torn in two different directions. You know, the word of God says, by his stripes, you're healed, but the doctor gives you a lab report that says you have stage four cancer and you're going to die. 
And so you have this, this troublesome situation. And what we have to do is we have to find a way to lay hold of the promise of God, be steadfast in it, be believing it, not deviate from it. And if we do that, then we're gonna have, we're gonna experience the salvation of God, the healing of God, as opposed to the failure that the so-called expert is trying to proclaim upon us. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Okay, the doctor, he gives you that lab result and says, you have cancer, you're gonna die. That's the wisdom of the wise, an example of that. Whereas um, God will save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. Well, the message that we're preaching is Jesus bore our sicknesses. Jesus carried our pains and by his stripes, we are healed. So we cling to that, that foolish message. Like how can you believe that you would be healed by somebody taking stripes on their back 2000 years ago? So it's a foolish sounding message. But if we believe in that, then we're gonna be the ones that are healed as opposed to those who worship whatever the doctor says and they're gonna be the ones who die. Okay, so we have to, we have to cling to the promise of God and he, he will make the world's wisdom foolish. He will make um, the doctor's report foolish and he will give us the victory. He will save us. We will be healed by clinging to his word. Amen. All right. So, so now what? Okay. So now we have to, we have to put into practice, you know, casting down and condemning words that are spoken against the promises of God. Okay, so in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay, so so this is a tool that God has given to us. We don't have to accept everything that's spoken to us. In fact, he wants us to cast down any argument, any high thing, like the opinion of a doctor. He wants us to cast down these arguments, the lab result, the high thing, the opinion of the doctor, which exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, so the knowledge of God says that Jesus bore our sicknesses so we can be healed and we can walk in health. The knowledge of God says that Jesus carried our pains so that we can be healed and we can live pain free. The knowledge of God says that Jesus took stripes on his back and he paid for our healing. The knowledge of God says that Jesus redeemed us from curse, so we are entitled to be unsickable, unkillable, uncursable, right? So that's the knowledge of God. But yet you have a doctor coming to you telling you, you have cancer, you're gonna die. Well, that is, that is an argument against the promise of God. That is a high thing, an opinion that is in contradiction to the promise of God. And so we have to make a decision. Am I going to accept this bad news or am I going to cast it down and reject it? And so we need to make the decision to cast it down and reject it. Amen. And it says a similar thing in the Old Testament in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Okay. He doesn't say that we just accept every word or thought that comes to us, but anything that's against us, like if the doctor says you have cancer and you're going to die, that is a tongue that has risen against you in judgment, proclaiming that you're going to die. You know, or maybe the doctor says, you know, your loved one, they had this stroke, they're never gonna walk again, they're gonna be a vegetable. Okay, you don't wanna accept that. You want to condemn those words. We have been given the power to condemn words, tongues that rise against us in judgments. You will never walk again. You will never talk again. You'll never have cognition. You'll never be able to speak. You'll never be able to remember. You'll never be able to walk or, or whatever number of things a doctor could say or a relative or, or anyone, you know, we, we don't want to accept those things, but we want to immediately condemn those words, right? And it doesn't have to be words that are spoken. It could be just a thought that comes into your mind. You know, maybe you're, maybe you've been praying for your loved one that had a, you know, a stroke or something. And you're having thoughts, well, they're never gonna walk, they're never gonna talk, they're never gonna do this or that. And so you're having those thoughts and you can't, you can't meditate on those things. You have to reject those thoughts. Those thoughts are from the devil one way or the other. The, the devil wants you to, to have failure. The devil wants them 
that person that you're praying for to die or to suffer or whatever. And so you don't want to entertain those thoughts of failure. You want to cast them down immediately. And then you want to lay hold again of whatever promise of God you're believing in. Because he says you want to cast down, cast down the argument that's against the will of God. And then it says, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So what does that mean? So that means that the doctor says, um, you have stage four cancer, you're going to die. And, and then you say, I reject those words in the name of Jesus for by the stripes of Jesus, my healing is paid for. I say, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. And so you proclaim the promise that you're believing in to destroy the argument that rose against you. Okay. Or if it's even if it's a thought in your mind, you're like, I, I don't know if my mom's going to make it. I think it's, it's not looking good. I don't know if she's going to make it. So those thoughts were coming to me when I had my situation with my mom. And so I had this like, in the name of Jesus, I reject those thoughts. Those thoughts of death and destruction, they will not come true. For by the stripes of Jesus, my mom is healed. And so I, I had to cast it down. And by proclaiming the promise I'm believing in, I'm taking that thought into captivity. I'm making that thought of failure and sickness bow down to the stripes of Jesus, bow down to his bearing of sickness, you know, or, or anything like that, right? So that's the principle that we want to put into practice. And, and we can look and see how Jesus did it. And so in Luke chapter 4 and in Matthew chapter 16, we'll look at a couple of examples. So, you know, in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4, it's when Jesus was being tempted by the devil. And... We'll look at one of those examples here. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. If you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So what we see is whenever the devil would give a thought to Jesus, the first thing he did is, It is written. Okay, so the devil's telling him one thing, but he's saying, This, this is what's written in the word. This is the promise of God that I'm believing in. Okay, so we always want to, we want to stand on the promise of God. Okay, and the second time in verse 8, Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written. Okay, so when the devil gives you a thought, like my loved one's going to die, or this isn't working, or they're never going to be healed, they'll never walk again. Okay, that's the devil who's talking to you. Whether it's through a person or just a thought in your mind, it's from the devil one way or the other. And so just command him. In the name of Jesus, Satan, you are a liar. I command you and your lies depart from me right now. In the name of Jesus, I condemn these words of failure that have come to me. I reject them. They will not come true. For it is written, believers lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. For it is written, by his stripes, I am healed. You know, so you just want to take the, the principle that Jesus demonstrated here, command the devil and his lies to depart from you, and then you want to proclaim what you're believing in. It is written by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed, you know, or whatever scripture you want to lean on. Okay, so that's how Jesus did it. And he, so that's, that's an example of Jesus casting down what the devil's saying, and then taking the devil's thought into captivity. Okay, in Matthew 16, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Okay, so you, here you have, you know, Jesus is looking at Peter and he's like, Get behind me, Satan. And he's talking to Peter. Well, what's going on there? Like, it's, it's Peter. Well, the devil uses people to speak his will through people to affect you. So the devil will use a doctor to give you a doomsday report. The, the, the devil will use your relative to speak death and destruction on your loved one you're praying for. And so the devil works through people 
and directly against you, right? So he's going to work in a variety of different ways. And so the principle is the same, you know, just command the devil and these evil thoughts to go. So exercise your authority. And, and then also be diligent in just proclaiming, you know, what you believe. Amen? And so when we do that, you know, this is a great way to deal with like preliminary diagnoses. And I would say 100% of the time when somebody has come to us and said, you know, I, I went to the doctor, I have a lump in my breast and they think it's breast cancer. 100% of the time when we've had an early diagnosis for something like that, uh, cancer has been nullified. Not one of them has ever turned out to be cancer because we cast down that idea of cancer. 100% success. Amen. I mean, so this is a powerful thing. You know, we don't want to accept the bad news that the devil's proclaiming. You know, the earlier you can cast it down, the better. You know, when it's just beginning to be a bad idea, like I think maybe this person has cancer, or I think this, or I think that. Like just when it's a bad idea is starting to form, but before they start adding a bunch of lab results and different things on top of it, cast down in the beginning, and that's the best time to do it. Okay, and then you say, well, what happens if I cast down cancer and it doesn't work? Well, I mean, Jesus paid for healing, so now just switch over and pray for healing. Amen? But it's better to reject something, and if you can reject it, that's better than having to go through some long ordeal pushing for healing. But either way, you know, Jesus has paid for us to cast down. He's paid for us to be healed. So don't despair if your effort to cast down doesn't work. You know, we just, we minister healing, and we still have victory. One of the problems that we have in the church is people have ideas that, you know, it's not, you know, they, maybe they've been praying for somebody and they haven't seen healing happen yet. And they'll make up doctrines and say, well, it's not God's time for this person to be healed, or it's not God's will for this person to be healed. And the reality is um, that's not, that's not what's going on. Our believing determines the time of healing. Okay. So, the timing of our healing is not based on God. The timing of our healing is based on what we believe. The timing of our healing is literally, it's paid for 2,000 years ago. And so 2,000 years ago, Jesus took stripes on his back and he paid for our healing. And so, you know, from God's perspective, it's a done deal. Just like 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross and paid for our salvation. So salvation is a done deal from God's perspective. Nobody's waiting on God for them for them to be saved. In the same way, nobody's waiting on God for them to be healed. You know, a person gets saved whenever they arise in faith and they confess him. In the same way, a person becomes healed whenever they arise in faith and make a confession of their faith. So in both cases, whether it's healing or salvation, Jesus already paid for it. So now it's on us to make it happen. Okay, so in Matthew 17, 15 to 20, Lord, have mercy Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Okay, so here we have a lot of things going on, but but you can see, first of all, the, the disciples failed in their effort to heal the boy. Yet they had previously, in all the previous chapters, they had been healing the sick and they had great success and they were excited about it and they had told Jesus about it. So they were excited about the miraculous works that were happening. But in this particular case, they did not heal the boy. And the problem is, I, I you know, it's not written here, but I'm pretty sure what happened is the boy had epilepsy. We know that the boy, when he came into the presence of Jesus, he started having a seizure. So I guarantee you that when 
the disciples were ministering to the boy. He was having a seizure. So he's like flopping around like a fish on the ground, foaming at the mouth and whatever else is going on. Eyes are rolling back in the head. So all those traumatic, visually traumatic things are happening. And when those visually traumatic things are happening, it's hard to believe because everything you're seeing with your eyes is like, this is impossible. There's no way we're going to be able to heal this. You see like how terrible it is, right? And so I guarantee you that's what happened to them which caused them to, in that moment, be faithless, right? So they weren't always faithless, but in this particular situation, they were faithless. And it's because the devil was putting on a show. And whenever he puts on a, a traumatic show like that, it's hard to believe when you're looking at these crazy things happening with your eyes. And so that's an important point because just like if you're trying to minister healing to somebody and they keep going on and on and you know, I've had this thing for 10 years and it's so terrible and it hurts so bad. And, and they just like they go on and on with this long list of problems and how bad it is. And by the time they're finished with all that, you know, you're, if you had faith, it's gone because they've made it into this big insurmountable problem. And it's hard to have faith in the face of that. So what we want to do is, you know, try and separate yourself from visually traumatic things. Try, you know, if you're ministering to someone else and they just keep going on and on and on telling you how bad it is, you have to like stop them. You're like, you know what? Just time out a second. Uh, I just want to know very briefly, what are the symptoms? What's the diagnosis? We can't go into a big history because we don't want to make this thing into a giant. We want it to be a grasshopper. We want our faith in God to be the giant and we want this problem we're dealing with to be the grasshopper. But if you keep going on and on like this, then nobody's going to have faith and nothing's going to happen, right? So you have to, you know, politely uh, interrupt people and stop them from going on and on because it's just going to lead to failure, okay? But in the end, though, Jesus was able to get the boy healed. So something to think about, like in the church today, you know, if we were to minister healing to somebody and they they weren't healed right away, you know, that. That's where people invent doctrines. Well, it's not God's will for this person to be healed. That's why we prayed and nothing happened. You know, it's not God's will. You know, so that's where wrong doctrine comes from whenever there's failure. And we have to be careful about that because it, it just requires faith. You know, Jesus had faith. And when he put his faith into practice, the boy was healed. But we have to be careful not to invent doctrines just because we don't see success. You know, we have to go back and look at Jesus and let our, our doctrine be based on Jesus. And he was perfect in his healing ministering and we're to do the same works. And so we should also be perfect. Another example would be in Matthew 9, 20 to 22. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Okay, so here you have a really interesting situation. So this woman, she had faith because she had heard about you know, what Jesus was doing. So she had faith because of the testimonies that she heard. And then she, um, in one gospel, says she, she said out loud. Another one says she said within herself, but she, whether it was out loud or within herself, it doesn't really matter. But she had faith and she was speaking her faith. Um, if only I may touch this garment, I shall be made well. Right. So she had faith and she was speaking her faith. And we know that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So she's believing that when she touches him, she's going to be made well. And so she's speaking her faith. And then she puts an action to her faith and she went and touched him. And, and she was healed instantly, boom, just healed. And so Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Okay, so, you know, again, like in church, they would say, well, it wasn't God's will for her to be healed. Um, his will was that, you know, she needs to suffer for some period of time to work something out in her. You know, you'll hear crazy doctrines like that, especially in particular denominations. Um, but the reality is, you know, she suffered for 12 years, but the moment that she arose in faith and and said this within herself and attached an action to her faith. The moment she did that, she was healed. And so the timing of her healing had nothing to do with God. The timing of her healing had to do with her own faith. And when her faith was established and when she 
made a confession of faith in verse 21, and when she took an, uh, an action related to her faith. And so it was the timing of her healing was in her hands. It wasn't that God was delaying anything. Okay, so that's the important point. So we want to arise in faith. And I wanted to talk about something else here. Um, so it's, it's the same story, but in Luke, it gives some different details. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Okay, so people think that, you know, that God is making a decision. I want I want Mitch to be healed, um, not Bobby. I want Kathy to be healed, not Bobby. <laughs> you know, they think he's picking and choosing and picking and choosing. They think that anytime there's a healing, it's like a conscious effort of God, like he chose a particular person to be healed. Okay, but the reality is, Jesus chose everybody to be healed. Just Jesus chose everybody to be saved. He chose everyone to have their sins forgiven. So all the things that Jesus suffered and paid for already, he did that for all people, right? And so he, um, he already chose everybody to be healed. So he's not making conscious decisions today. You know, heal that one, not this one. Heal that one, but not that one. Okay, so for example, he, he said, who touched me? So he didn't even know who touched him. He, he didn't even know who this power went into. And so it wasn't like Jesus willfully chose, I want this woman who's been suffering for 12 years to be healed. He didn't consciously choose her and he had no idea who it was that actually drew this healing power out of her. So what happened is this woman had faith and her faith, when she put her faith into action, it drew the power from God directly and he didn't even know who did it. So he didn't choose her. He didn't like pick her out and say, I want this one to be healed. Amen. So her faith dictated when she got healed. Her faith dictated when the power of God would flow. And so we want to keep that in mind. So we want our faith to be rich. You know, we, we don't want to blame God for the timing of things. It's on us. You know, as soon as she put her faith into practice, the, the power flowed and she received her healing. Amen. I mean, this is a phenomenal revelation, just realizing that Jesus didn't pick her out. You know, he didn't even know who touched him, but her faith drew the power of God from him. And in the same way, we, we can do that the same thing. You know, our faith will draw the power of God. Amen. Okay. And then one more example, the same thing happened with the blind men in Matthew 9, 27 to 30. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. Okay, so again, we have these two men. They were following Jesus because they heard about or saw, well, they didn't see, but they heard about the things that Jesus was doing. And so they knew, they had faith in him. They knew that he would be the answer for their healing need. And so they're, they're following after Jesus and they're crying out for him. Like they wanted their healing. They're calling out to Jesus and they wanted mercy. And so then Jesus asked, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes. Okay, so they made a positive declaration of their faith. They believed that Jesus was the one who could heal them. And then he said, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. So again, in all of these examples we've looked at, it's whenever somebody had faith, the healing happened. Bobby. What we see in all, all of these examples is whenever the person arose in faith and whenever they put an action to their faith, that's when they received their healing. So it wasn't God picking and choosing. It wasn't God delaying things. You know, God's not the, the problem. He's not slowing things down. You know, Jesus already paid for everyone to be healed. So it's just a matter of somebody arising and operating in faith. And that's going to dictate when healing happens. And then you can have other things that war against it. You know, we talked about the devil. He tries to resist us and, and hinder things. Um, it's not God that's slowing us down. It's 
our own faith, and then the devil warring against us. Amen? Okay, so then we'll finish up here. So tips for ministering healing to yourself. So first of all, sometimes it can be more challenging to pray for your own healing need than to pray for other people. And, you know, why is that? And it's because, first of all, like many of us, we already believe in, in healing. We already believe in walking in health. So, you know, if sickness comes upon us, like we're in shock, like, how did this happen to me? You know, like I'm talking about myself, like, how did I get sick? I, I teach about healing. I believe in healing. How in the world did I get sick? And so you kind of start off the situation having your faith rock because I shouldn't have gotten sick in the first place. You know, so so that can be something that's warring against you. You know, how did this happen to me? I, I do have faith. Why did this happen? And so then that kind of like starts you off with the doubt. Um, it could be that, you know, except in the case of an instant healing, you know, if you have symptoms in your body and you're praying for yourself, the problem is that the symptoms are testifying against you. You know, so let's just say that, um, well, I had COVID, right? So I was like praying for, you know, COVID to leave. I was praying for the symptoms to leave, but yet I could still feel them. And then the presence of those symptoms is telling me, Bobby, it's not working. You don't have any faith. You're not, you're not healed. You still feel terrible. And so symptoms, they war against you and they produce doubt. And so it's easier to pray for somebody else because you're not experiencing their symptoms. So their symptoms aren't becoming a doubt for you. But, you know, you're, you're obviously experiencing your symptoms as long as the sickness is there. And so that, that's testifying against the fact that you're being healed. So that can make it challenging um, praying for yourself. And then the other thing, it could be that maybe the devil's just resisting you really hard because we are those who believe in healing and he he wants to produce doubt in us. You know, if he can keep resisting me and resisting me and I'm not experiencing the healing that I know I should have, then he's you know, working to destroy my faith. And not only does that impact me, but it also stops me from ministering to other people because he's produced doubt in me. And so these are some of the things that can be going on. And you know, like, why is this so difficult for me to get healing for myself? And, you know, these are some of the things that are kind of causing that difficulty. Okay, so what do we do about that? Okay, so first of all, you know, of course, the first thing that we always do, if we're sick or we have symptoms, we want to pray for our situation in faith, in authority. We want to pray with boldness and with intensity. You know, Jesus never prayed meek and mild um, prayers. He prayed he prayed fervently, you know, in a loud voice, or he rebuked a demon. So we want to pray with intensity. In the book of James, it says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So again, you know, Jesus wasn't, uh, oh, you little devil, get out of this person. Oh, fever, get out. You know, he was, he rebuked, you know, which is a sharp reprimand. It's authoritative, it's bold, it's strong. You know, with Lazarus, it says, with a loud voice, with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. You know, so whenever it describes how Jesus did something, you know, it was a rebuke. So it was sharp, intense, authoritative, or it was with a loud voice. So he was praying fervently. And it doesn't have to be loud, but it has, you have to have some passion in it. You have to be fervent about it being done. You know, you have to be serious about it being done. You have to truly want it and desire it and just put passion in that prayer. Amen. And of course, we already talked about how to pray. We pray by commanding, speaking to the mountain, pray with authority. Okay. The other thing that we can do is we can consume testimonies like before we pray for ourselves. And then every day, like, you know, as long as you're in the situation and you're working to be healed, just devour testimonies. That's one of the most powerful things we can do is just consume testimonies. And, you know, you can watch videos on Andrew Womack. You can read little booklets you can get on, on Amazon or wherever. But just devour testimonies because then you're going to see people just like yourself getting the victory. Some of them had instant healing. Some of them it took a long time. And so you can draw strength whatever situation you're dealing with, whether it's, you know, short or long term. You're going to get strengthened by seeing how other people persevered. What did they do to get the victory? And it's going to strengthen you. Okay. Um, then consume healing teaching. You know, as you're dealing with the situation, we shouldn't just lay in bed doing nothing. We should be consuming testimonies and consuming teaching. 
And we want to be strong in faith. Remember, it was the people's faith that determined the time of their healing. It wasn't God slowing things down or anything like that. You know, so we want to be rich in faith and be effective in our prayer and get as quick a result as possible. Okay, another tactic that you could try, or not try, but put into practice would be, you know, sometimes you know, treat, treat yourself like you're praying for somebody else. Like in the name of Jesus, I command COVID, get out of this body. You know, do this, do that. You know, so rather than... Um, Rather than praying for me, I can pray for me as if I'm another person. And so then sometimes I found that that's helpful for me to get results. Okay, maybe maybe you have a pain. Like let's just say there's a pain in your body and then you, you pray for this pain to leave and then the pain's still there all day long. You pray again and the pain's still there. And so you keep praying for yourself, but then you're doubting because every time you pray, you're still feeling the pain, you know, or whatever other kind of symptom you may have. So an a trick that I've done before is you know, pray right before you're going to bed. And so what you're going to do is you're going to pray, you're going to go to sleep, and then that way you're not meditating upon the symptoms that are still plaguing you because you're going to go to sleep and therefore you're not thinking and meditating about the symptoms which are producing a doubt within you. So um, I've had great results doing that. You know, like if I feel like I'm, I'm getting sick or something, you know, pray for myself right before I go to bed and then I wake up, I'm feeling fine. Okay, because that way the symptoms aren't warring against my faith producing doubt. Okay, you could also, you know, when you pray for yourself, uh, apply a work of faith. You know, so before I went to Uganda, I was extremely sick. I, I got COVID then. I was extremely sick. And, you know, I just, I was a mess. I couldn't really do anything. And it took a long time for me to be healed. Well, the second time that it happened, I was, I was more passionate about it. I'm like, no, 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 this isn't going to happen again. Uh, I have to start my new job. I'm not going to let this hinder me from my job. And so I was more passionate this time. I was applying works of faith. Like every day during that, I was going to the gym. I didn't feel like it, but I was going to the gym. I was doing what the devil didn't want me to do. I was not allowing him to bind me up and hinder me. I was not allowing him to stop my daily activity. I was not allowing him to put me in bed and keep me there. I was not allowing him to keep me from starting my new job. I was just determined to fight this. And so I was much more resistant and I was doing works. You know, I was, I'd pray for myself. I felt terrible, but then I go to the gym and run on the treadmill. And so I'm applying a work of faith. I'm acting as if I'm healed. And then that facilitated a much faster healing than what I had the first time. Okay. Then another thing that I put into practice, like when I first learned about healing, I had a neck and shoulder injury that I'd had for years. And so what I did, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there taking this Barry Bennett teaching and I was believing what I was reading. And then I would command the pain to leave. And for like, you know, like a, a second, the pain would leave. And then I would do it again and again. And so I was, I was frustrated, but excited at the same time. I was excited because it would leave just very briefly. And so, and I was frustrated because it was very brief and it kept coming back. And so I was just, you know, I just made the decision and you know, this is mine. I, I can see that it's going to work because I command the pain to go and it leaves, you know, just for a second. So something's happening. So I knew something was happening. And so I was just like maybe 20, 30 times a day, I was commanding the pain to leave. I was commanding the neck and shoulders to be healed. And then over a course of about two weeks, it finally was gone forever. And it was just from extreme persistence and extreme, you know, repetition and commanding. And I got victory over it. Amen. So sometimes, sometimes you can pray too much and it can be a hindrance. Sometimes you can pray a lot and it's going to be helpful. So you just have to find what works for you and what works in that situation. Okay, then, you know, as you're dealing with the healing situation for yourself, you want to increase in your ministering healing to other people. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, how can I pray for somebody else's healing if I myself am sick? Well, you never want to stop ministering healing to others because you're sick. Because then the devil's going to discover, you know, if I can just put, if I can make Bobby feel bad, he's not going to pray for anybody. I can just shut his ministry down. And so that's how the devil thinks. And so if you stop doing good deeds just because you don't feel good, then you guaranteed yourself a lifetime of not feeling good so that you never do anything for the kingdom of God. 
And so what you have to do is believe in the principle of sowing and reaping. And so if, if you're sick, um, you know, increase in ministering healing to others because you're giving away health and you're going to receive health. You're giving away healing, you're going to receive healing. Amen. And so sowing and reaping even works for healing. Okay, then also you want to have a daily positive confession of health and healing scriptures. And you could take a screenshot here real quick. And so these are some of the passages that I confess uh, on a regular basis. You know, so I cycle through a list of scriptures. So um, you should take these and con convert them into a confession, especially when you're having symptoms or you're fighting something every day, you should be confessing health and healing scriptures. And at the same time, avoid negative confession. So we talked about the need to cast down whatever the doctor's saying, the need to cast down whatever you know thoughts of failure are the devil's giving to your mind. You have to cast those things down and whatever you do, do not speak death because the devil tries to get us to make that negative confession. That a negative confession, like confessing the doctor report, um, that's a work of faith in the wrong direction and it'll surely come true. So we don't wanna do that. Okay, then related to this watching our speech, you have to be careful to tell as few people as possible about your situation. Because if you tell people that are not in faith, then they're going to really, they're really going to war against you and say, oh, you have such and such disease. Yeah, you're going to die and you're going to have this and that because you know, they're going to think like the world. You know, they're going to have worldly wisdom and they're going to proclaim that worldly wisdom. and They're constantly going to bring it up to you and that's not going to help you. It's going to work against you. And then you also want to avoid giving um, too many updates to people and, and that can happen that can easily happen, right? So people um, will pray in agreement for you. And then all of a sudden, all those you know 10 people prayed in agreement for you. Everybody wants to update. And so you're constantly updating and, and maybe it hasn't kicked in yet. You're not feeling the benefit yet. So now you're confessing 10 times that I still don't feel good. And so you see the devil uses those requests for updates sometimes to work against you. And so that's why like sometimes you guys have prayed for me and then I'm like radio silence for two or three days because I don't, I don't want to give updates yet. You know, so that's how I think. I don't want to give a bunch of updates if I don't have something good, like some progress to share, because I don't want to keep confessing I'm not there yet. I don't want to keep confessing I'm not there yet. Okay. So those are things to think about. You know, watch what you're saying. Also, we should all be praying in tongues. So I'm, one of the things about having this job, I'm happy that I get to drive to work every day. So now I have time on the road again. And that's for me the best time to pray in tongues. And, you know, we should do this apart from having any particular issue. We should just do it as standard practice. And, you know, even scientific studies have been shown that there's something like a 20 percent people who pray in tongues on a regular basis on average are you know 20 percent healthier, have less issues than people who don't. And that's apart from anything that we know about whether they believe in healing or not. It's just a benefit. You know, you get you get faith benefits from praying in tongues. You get benefit with the problems you're facing and you just get a general health and well-being benefit from praying in tongues. Okay, and, and then lastly, I put this last on purpose. Ideally, we want to try and get our victories ourselves. Now, if you have a life and death situation or a dire situation, then pull people in immediately. But apart from that, you know, try and get your victories you know, on your own because you're gonna get stronger that way. You're gonna have more confidence. But if you need to, or if it's dire, then pull somebody in, you know, and the prayer of agreement is a tremendously powerful thing. Amen.